You're about to watch a video that I've put together, and it's not just me speaking, but five different ways that you can change the way you think about money. I think the first step to being wealthy, to being prosperous, is to change your mindset. And there are five things you can actually do today to change it. And it comes from someone who has a lot of experience in that area. Please make sure you watch the whole thing. I promise you this can change your whole way of thinking. It'll help you become more prosperous as you go forward. My husband and I didn't start thinking this way. Um, you're gonna understand what I say as you go through the five things that you can change, but we didn't start thinking this way till about 10 years ago. We were in our early 50s. And one of the things, the reason I tell you that is never too late to change your thinking. You're gonna find that we are being taught as a, through our school system and through our culture to think of money a certain way. And after you look at this video, my hope, my prayer for you is that you will start thinking differently. And that's the first step. And also to believe you're not too young, you're not too broke, you're not too unintelligent, and you're not too old. Anybody can become wealthy. Now, it depends on how you define that. Wealthy doesn't mean becoming a millionaire. Everybody thinks I have to become a millionaire or I'm a failure. That is not becoming wealthy. Each person determines the amount of income that they need or that they want to have a life that fulfills all of their needs. And that is a whole nother process or a whole nother video. What I want you today to do today is go through this video, make these five changes, and these are your first steps and figuring out where you want to go after that. My husband and I are planning our retirement. You might be saying, well, it's too late to do that. Shouldn't you have a 401k and all of that? It's never too late. If you ever read the um, but biography of Warren Buffett, he was in his 60s before he became wealthy. So I think some of us hit retirement and we're like, whoa, what, what did we do wrong? And so again, it's not too late. It's not too early. Pay attention and listen to this guy. He knows what he's talking about. They don't want what we know out there. You'll never get those on CNBC. But our school system will never tell us that because they're part of the process. Fake money, fake teachers, fake assets. I know the game of the rich. My rich dad taught me, you know it because you're the banker. The bankers and the rich play is different than what they teach you in school. All over the world, what does school teach you about money? And the answer is nothing. And that's not a mistake. That's not an accident. I knew that. Most people know that. The way to keep the poor and middle class working hard is never teach them what the rich know. So if you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, which came out in 1997, it's what the rich teach their kids about money, the poor middle class do not. Poverty hurts. I mean, I don't like it. And I don't like that our academic system is so corrupt. You know, we, we know the banking system is corrupt. We know politics is corrupt. But, ac but academics is just as corrupt. I mean, one thing if it's the banking and the politics, but this is where we send our children and we trust them to do the right things for them. And yet they're being not taught something so fundamental. Like you asked your dad when you were a kid, dad, you asked your teacher, when are you gonna tell, teach us about money? And it was just, never, well, never. And they'll never will. You know something, what do you know? Share it. What is financial education? It's not get a job, work hard, save money, and invest in a well-diversified portfolio, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and ETFs. The financial industry is two things, debt and taxes. 1971, Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard and the U.S. dollar became debt. And we still tell kids to go to school, get a job, work hard, save money, and get out of debt. Now, who tells them to do that? That's the most ridiculous thing there is. The book starts and it says, line number one, saving money will make you rich. Yeah, it never will. You well, know that. All taught that as kids. Why would you save it and why would you work for it if they can print it? as faster than you can work for it. Why do you keep saving when they're printing it? The rich don't work for money. Don't you touch that stuff. It's very subtle, right? Yep. They don't say, I'm gonna train you to be a worker bee the rest of your life, but they educate you in a way where that's what you come out. Right. 
So there you have it, number one. The rich do not work for money. This is twofold. One, most of us are taught, go get a job. My father, my parents came from the depression and I honestly thought I was supposed to stay at a job for 30 years and wasn't able to quit. I'll never forget, I moved away from home to the city. I was living up in Chicago and a friend of mine, and I got a job, a part-time job. Our husbands were in the Navy at the time. And what we were gonna do is babysit each other's kids. It's all irrelevant. But I remember we were at this one place for like a week. I think it was the Solo Cup Company. And a lot of different people worked there, a lot of different languages, um, you know, very diverse. Um, but the thing that freaked her out was we were counting lids as they came off of this machine and it caught on fire. And her, one of the ladies said, oh, don't worry about it. It happens all the time. She about freaked out and she said, we were driving home. We were working third shift and she said, we are not going back. I'm like, we have to go back. We can't just quit. And it, it was traumatizing for me, but now I understand things don't work that way. We have to take responsibility of our income and not depend on somebody else. And that's one of the big reasons you don't wanna be working for somebody else. And plus there's a ceiling on the amount of money you can make. You'll find that out, especially if you're young. Um, there just comes that moment when you have no control over making more money. The other thing is, if you are already uh, an entrepreneur minded person, which you have an edge on others, you still don't wanna work or start your business for money. You want to do something you're passionate about and something that you have a mission and a purpose of what you're sharing with others. So that's really important too. What else was he, what was he trying to do those first few months where you were working for him? What was he trying to get across to you? Because he taught you the hard way about money. And she says, if you're going to be a successful in your life, you've got to find the best teachers. And a great teacher is somebody who comes from the inside, not the outside. But in school, you don't know if your instructor is for real or not. That's where the fake teacher comes from. I said, I want you to teach me about money. So it was, so why should I teach you? He said, but if I teach you, you work for me for free. And I said, why for free? My dad, my poor dad went nuts. He says, because if I pay you, you think like an employee. Your, brains will, your brain will change. If you learn never to work for money, you'll be a rich man. And this is powerful. Once you give someone a paycheck, their brain turns off. Correct. Because it's and then the promise of a pension. Right. And job security. Which is kind of a paycheck in disguise. Correct. After you stop working. Give the man a fish, eats for the day, teach him to fish, eats Correct. for a lifetime. And most poor people confuse assets mm -hmm. for liabilities. They think their home is an asset, it's actually a liability. Right. An asset is a noun, like a house. Cash flow is a verb. So to understand if it's an asset or liability, it, it takes a noun plus verb. So if the cash is flowing out of your pocket, it's a liability. If the cash is flowing into your pocket, asset, verb, it's an asset. So I own 7,000 rental properties. Those are assets. Every month, the cash flows in. Whereas many people have the big house on the hill and the cash is flowing out they're going broke right it's like a, a frame of mind number two really resonated with me create cash flow I always thought growing up that my house was an asset I I bought my first house in my early 20s $29,000 I think it's worth a lot more than that right now but I remember buying that thinking of that as an asset usually people get a house and it ends up going to their heirs, their children when they die, right? That that's It doesn't create any cash flow for you. It's nothing but something that you're putting money into. So that's why it's not an asset. Now, if you have a house, I, I have a friend, uh, she was unmarried at the time. She lived near a college town and she bought a four bedroom house and she rented out three of the rooms. Her house, she lived in it, but it was also an asset. It was not a liability. And I thought that was so clever of her to do that. She had no problem with other single people living in her house, sharing everything, and it went fine for her. And she ended up, last time I talked to her, buying a second home. And that one was also an asset. So when cash flow is something that you own, that is causing cash to come in. It's, you're usually talking about rentals, short-term rentals, things like that. Um, but have that kind of mindset. Your house is a liability. It's not an asset. And cash flow is something that you want to create out of that asset that's just going to keep coming in. We own some rentals. Um, you can see the rest of my channel. We're getting into the VRBO 
uh, area. We haven't entered it yet. We're building a unique rental and our rentals, the, the long-term rentals, are giving us cash flow. Good, we've got good renters in and basically it's money coming in and it's kind of awesome. And you'll hear in the video, he said he owns 70,000 rentals. I can't imagine, but <laughs> it's all cash flow. And he probably has property managers that he pays to take care of them. It's, it, you've got you've to gotta let go of what you, uh, you think of money as. It, money doesn't make money. We just use money to help us hit those goals that we want. So if you have 70,000 rentals or 100 rentals, you're going to need a property manager to help you. So the cash that you're getting, you're paying somebody else to help you. But it's not the money making money. It's what you do with the money. So The other thing the poor don't understand is the number one expense for most people is taxes. And yet we don't even see it. Isn't that weird? You walk around and you look at the paycheck and say, ah, oh, that doesn't seem right. And you don't realize that the government's got a huge hand in your pocket and you are doing nothing to minimize that. Again, right. this is what's very different about the rich and the poor. The rich don't work for money. It's number one expense is tax. See, there's three kinds of income. Earned, portfolio, passive. So earned income is if I get a job, that's earned income. If I'm a doctor or a programmer, that's earned income because I'm working for it. If I, buy a, if I buy, let's say, Apple for $10 and I send it for 20 that's uh, portfolio income capital gains yeah but passive income which is cash flow is never taxed and so all these guys are screaming right now in america tax the rich i said good luck because most of the guys complaining they don't know the three kinds of income and the rich don't have jobs anyway they have assets and so the average schmo out there a poor guy you know sent the kid to school they don't learn this you see very few people will buy what i do make a million dollars and pay zero tax. And my rich dad taught me that playing Monopoly. That's how it started, you know, four greenhouses, one red hotel. Or the McDonald's formula, I write about it there. McDonald's, Ray Kroc. Yeah. McDonald's is in the real estate business, so they sell hamburgers, but they buy real estate, so they pay no taxes. You know, this guy Bezos, well, he's $16 billion. How much tax did they pay on that 16 billion? that's all legal, anyone can do it. Everybody can do but it. But everyone, most people lack the education. So once you learn how to use debt as money, you can never say, I can't afford it. You see, because the banks will give you, so the banks, after the crash of 2008, the banks gave me $300 million tax-free. When I asked the average guy, I said, can you, why don't you use debt? They can't even get a loan. Because their scores, their FICO scores, well, they don't even have them here, are so bad. The school teachers will never tell you that because they don't know it. My poor dad never knew that. You don't know if something is an asset or a liability until you can say which way the cash flows. So a house, is that an asset or a liability? Well, if it's taking money from your pocket, it's a liability. If it's putting money in your pocket, it's an asset. The U.S. government wants me to provide housing, wants me to provide jobs, wants me to borrow money because that's how money is created through debt, I get huge tax breaks. Everybody can do the same thing if they had the financial education to do it. If people understood the tax code, we'd be more prosperous. But can poverty be passed through genetically? Yes. Because it's some type of way of thinking. It's an attitude. An attitude. It's very simple. When, I, when people ask me, how do I stop it? I just say, never say, I can't afford it. Ask yourself, how can I? The reason I have so much money is because I don't say I can't do it. I just go, how can I do it? And I just go and do it. I make a lot of mistakes, but that's how I learn. How can I? The poor people, like my poor dad, always said I can't afford it. You think I'm made of money? I'm a school teacher. I can't do that. And I picked that up. And my rich dad never said those words. So when I meet poor people, they use the words I can't a lot. So the people that say, I can't afford it, I can't do this, I can't get to college, the rich are evil, you know, I choose not to participate in that. And that's one thing people could change today, Correct. right now, is that dialogue in their head. Stop saying the word can't. I can't. Right. So how can I? How can I? Especially as in, I can't afford it, how can I afford that? Right. Because that opens them up to looking at it as an investment to a greater future. I love number three because all of my life I was taught, don't go into debt. 
and I didn't. I kept trying to pay off debt, you know, pay off my house. And it's kind of a scarcity mindset because you're constantly worried about money and trying to get those coupons to buy groceries and, and you're constantly letting that money control you. But you can go into debt to buy assets. Don't go into debt to pay your grocery bill or to get concert tickets or, or crazy things or all these little gifts and gadgets, games and gadgets that you want. Go into debt to buy something that's going to give you some cash flow. You're using the system to help you. And did you know on your taxes, all of that, like when we bought our first duplex, all the interest that we paid on our duplex when we borrowed the money, we could claim on our taxes. It came right off the top. Um, all of anything that we put into that duplex. And, and that's where when you'll hear him talking about in this, this video that you don't pay taxes, that's because it, the tax system is set up to favor people who go into debt to create more business. So how can I? How can I? Especially as in, I can't afford it, how can I afford that? Right. Because that opens them up to looking at it as an investment to a greater future. Right. You know, when I borrowed $300 million, I couldn't do it when, until I went to ask. And I got turned down so many times. I said, you know, and I, every time I, I showed the banker my financials and he go, sorry, I said, look, do me a favor. Why did you turn me down? And he told me. This is out, the numbers are out here. So if, so if I get these numbers fixed, can I come see you again? He goes, sure. So it's called rejection. You know, same as my wife rejected me for six months. It's just a matter of personal willpower, which is spiritual. Just saying, if they can do it, I can do it. And how can I? How can I? And I think it's you once said, words become flesh. Yep. It was the Bible too. Intelligence increases through your mistakes, through the ups and downs, through what you learn. Real estate's real estate, but what I learned made me richer, not the money. <laughs> you don't need money to make money. Number four is so crucial. Stop saying I can't, not just in your business, not just in trying to create cash flow, but in everything. Stop saying I can't. If you have found yourself caught in a victim mindset, I was there at one time in my life. I um, found myself, um, I was young. I had my first child when I was still a teenager. And I remember being in a culture because of my situation where everybody was trying to find ways for me to have a victim mindset and take from the government, if that makes sense. I had people leading me to go get food stamps, go, you know, get this, go get that. And I remember thinking, yeah, but I don't need to do that. Now I was poor, don't get me wrong, but I was happy with where I was. I wasn't blowing money on different things and I, I made it on what I had, but my mindset was, I, I can figure this out. I can do it. And I did. Um, I went to college. I became a teacher. And I didn't want to be locked. I, I didn't want to be locked into this mindset of the world owes me something and I can't do anything. You can. I don't care who you are, where you're at in life, you can. You've got to change that mindset. And don't depend on other people to take care of you. I'm adding to that. Be responsible for where you are in life and be responsible for the decisions you make to go forward. It may be rougher for some people. Absolutely. But that's part of life. And you know what? If you have to climb harder to get to the top of the hill, you probably will have more character and more drive and more persistence than somebody else that hardly had to try at all. I remember watching basketball when my son was young and just watching, there was always this little kid that was um, on, on his team. I don't even remember his name now, but I just remember the the drive that this kid had whenever we went to play basketball or whenever they played baseball, he was always, it was a small town and there was always the same group of kids playing all the sports, but he had more grit in him than any of these bigger kids that could just do it naturally. So sometimes that's a good thing if you're the underdog. So don't see it as negative. Sometimes it can turn out to be a really good thing in the end. You know, I think all of us, every human being has that low point in their life. And if they get the message, a new life begins. If they don't get the message, they keep going down. The richer I got was because I didn't need any money. I could use this to make money. But 
how did I get there? So I made a lot of mistakes. People are afraid of making mistakes and all this, fear of failing. It limits them. Yeah. Nice, nice, so very nice. So many people trapped in the same device. Number five is kind of a, the, the, a segue off of number one. Don't work for money. Okay, so we're not working for other people to make money from them, but you're not working for money either. And I kind of mentioned that earlier. You want to have the mindset that I'm working because I love what I'm doing. I'm providing something for somebody out there. I have a mission in my life. It's a sole purpose. And when you do that, it, the money will just start coming. And, and your enthusiasm will just flourish from that because you're doing it for other reasons and you will be rewarded for that. So have a passion for something and you may not know what that is right now or you may feel like, oh gosh, you know, that, that's such a tough one and it is. So right now, just start changing your how you think about money and then all of that will come to you. You be blessed, have a wonderful day and I'll see you on the next video.